Good morning. It's good to be together this morning. I appreciate this time that we've been able to spend in worship together. And I appreciate you. I appreciate this church family and the warm welcome that you've already extended to us, especially in wearing the color orange. I didn't even know about that, and I'm matching you this morning. That's not something that we saw a whole lot of in Kentucky. If you're one like Jacob who doesn't like to wear the color orange, we'll spend some time working on that. But... <laughs> We want you to know that we could not be more happy to be with you here at the Highland Heights Congregation. We look forward to serving the Lord and serving our community together. This morning we're going to talk about a reality that all of us experience, perhaps on a daily basis. We're going to talk about a reality that this congregation is experiencing right now on both sides of this relationship as we go through a transition. We live in a world that is constantly changing. When I think about myself, when I think about my life personally, this is something that I've seen over the last few months. This is something that's been impressed even further on my heart and on my mind as a result of what I've been through over the last few months. Going back to December of 2023, my wife Leslie and I welcomed our first child into the world, Anna Jean. As you can imagine, There's a lot of change. There's a lot of transition that goes along with that. Then you go to the next month, January of 2024. My mother, Kim Alverson, passed away after a 22-month battle against cancer and appreciate all that this congregation did to support us and encourage us in that. It was a difficult time and continues to be a very difficult time. Last month, February of 2024, Leslie and I ended our work with a group of people who we love in Mayfield, Kentucky, working as the preacher, the minister at Seven Oaks Church of Christ. This month, March of 2024, we've moved back home. We've moved states. We've moved from Kentucky to Tennessee, and today we're starting a brand new work and getting to know a brand new church family. Over the last few months, I feel like I've been living in a world that is constantly changing. And some of that change is really good. Some of the change has been for the better. Some of the change has been welcomed. And there's no way that we would ever go back to the way that it was. We wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. But as I'm sure you know, some of the change that we've been through over the last few months has been very difficult. It's brought a lot of grief and anxiety and stress into our hearts and lives. Now, I want you to know that I'm not trying to elevate myself this morning. I'm not trying to exalt myself this morning. I just want to use my life, what I've been through over the last few months, as an illustration for what we're going to be talking about this morning. Because this isn't just true for me. As we said just a few moments ago, this is true for every single person inside of this room this morning. We live in a world that is constantly changing. Our lives change. Our families and friends change. Our children and grandchildren change. Our homes change. Our locations change. Our jobs, responsibilities, and hobbies change. Our ages change. Our bodies change. Our congregations, at least in some ways, change Over time, it all goes back to what we see up on the screen. We live in a world that is constantly changing. And some of that change is good. Some of the change is for the better. Some of the change is welcome. That once the change happens, there's no way that we would go back to the way that it was before. But other times, change and transition brings fear, uncertainty, stress, grief, worry, and anxiety. There was an ancient philosopher who lived about 500 years before Jesus, and here's the way that he said it. He said the only constant in life is change. It might feel that way sometimes, but I want to suggest to you this morning that that ancient philosopher actually could not be farther away from the truth. For those of us who are Christians, For those of us who have made the decision to follow Jesus on a daily basis in the midst of an ever-changing world, there are some things that don't change. There are some things that remain constant. Aren't you thankful for that? Aren't you grateful for that? 
In the midst of a world that's always changing, in the midst of a world that's always shifting, as Christians, we have things that we can place our feet on. We have a foundation that we can stand upon that's never going to shift, that's never going to fail us. We have certain ideas, certain things that we can place our trust in because these things never change. These things always remain constant. In the midst of an ever-changing world, we so often search for consistency. The Word of God is the only place where we can find true consistency. And so let's go there this morning. This morning, I want us to talk about three constants in a constantly changing world. As we live in the midst of a world that's constantly changing, in the midst of a world that's constantly shifting, number one, the faithfulness of God does not change. The faithfulness of God remains constant. As we read just a few moments ago in Malachi chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. When you look at the book of Malachi as a whole, we need to recognize that this was the last Old Testament book to be written down. Actually, if you're reading through your Old Testament, it's the last book that you're going to read in that portion of God's Word. God, through the prophet Malachi, is speaking to the people of Judah. The people of Judah have returned from Babylonian captivity. They're once again occupying the city of Jerusalem. They've rebuilt the city of Jerusalem. They've rebuilt the walls. Specifically, they've rebuilt the temple, the place where they spent time in worship to God. They were encouraged, strengthened, renewed by the ministries of people like Ezra and Nehemiah. But it didn't take them long to fall back into their old ways. It didn't take them very long to fall back into the sins that they were committing 150 years prior, the sins that originally caused them to go into captivity in the first place. And so when you look at Malachi chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, God speaking through the prophet Malachi is addressing that. You look at the first couple of verses, God's talking about the messenger who He is going to send. And this messenger is going to start this purification and refining process among the people of Judah, specifically in the temple. And then you look in 3 and 4 and you find the idea that this messenger and this purification, this refining process, it's going to begin with the priest. It's going to begin with the Levites so that the Israelites' offerings to God would once again be pleasing and acceptable in His sight. Then you come to verse number 5 and God talks about how He's going to judge the people of Judah for their sin. He's going to hold them accountable for all these different kinds of wickedness that they were choosing to live in. All of that conversation leads us to this powerful statement in Malachi chapter 3 and verse number 6 where God Himself says, I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. Is God going to judge the people of Judah for their sin? Is He going to hold them accountable for the evil and the wickedness that they chose to live in? Of course He is. So why doesn't He go ahead and do that? Why doesn't He go ahead and consume them? Why doesn't He go ahead and destroy them as a result of their sin, as a result of their evil? He had done that to previous nations. He had done that to previous people groups. For instance, you go back to Malachi, the first chapter, and the Bible talks about how God destroyed the nation of Edom as a result of their sin. Why didn't He do that to the tribe of Judah, the nation of Judah, the southern kingdom? Why didn't He go ahead and judge them, consume them, destroy them? The answer is found right there in verse 6. Israel's survival as God's people were not dependent upon themselves. Israel didn't live to see another day because they deserved to live and see another day. Israel's survival was not based on their own goodness. Their survival was based upon the goodness and the faithfulness of their God. That's the message in verse number 6. God says, I the Lord do not change, and that's the reason that you haven't been destroyed. That's the reason that you haven't already been consumed because I in my faithfulness do not change. God was being faithful to His promises. He was being faithful to the covenant that He had made with them going back to Exodus chapter 19 and Exodus chapter 20 on Mount Sinai. And that's the reason that they had not been consumed. In the midst of a constantly changing world, the faithfulness of God remains constant. I don't know about you, but I look forward to March Madness. You can tell the team that I root for, and I'm, I'm hoping that they're going to go far in the tournament. 
But in this tournament, the NCAA basketball tournament, you have 64 teams that come together. It's a single elimination tournament. That means if you win, then you play the next game, but if you lose, then you go home. Think about how the tournament works. You have to earn your way into the tournament by having a really good regular season. And then once you earn your way into the tournament, you have to continue to win to survive. You have to continue to win to advance. Do we ever view our relationships with God that way? That in order to get in with God, I have to earn it. I have to deserve it. I have to merit it. And then once I finally get in good with God, I have to continue to win because if I lose just one time, then I'm going to go home. I have to live a perfect life. I have to live a sinless life. I can't afford to make a mistake because when I make that one mistake, God's going to throw me to the side and be done with me forever. If we choose to live in sin, is God going to judge us? Is He going to hold us accountable? Is it true, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10, that we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that we will receive what is due for what we've done in the body, whether those things be good or whether those things be bad? Is it true that a Christian can be genuinely saved by the grace of God and then fall away from that grace? Is it true that we have responsibility to live faithfully to God on a daily basis? I believe the answer to all of those questions is 100% yes, absolutely. But we also have to take into account what we find in Malachi chapter 3 and verse number 6. Our survival, spiritually speaking, our relationships with God are not fully dependent on us. We don't survive to see another day because we deserve it, because we've earned it, we merit it, we're worthy of it in some kind of way. Our survival is not dependent upon our own goodness. Our survival is dependent upon the goodness and the faithfulness of our God. Just like Malachi 3 and verse 6 could be applied to the people of Judah, it could be applied to us today. The only reason that we haven't been consumed, the only reason that we haven't been destroyed as a result of our own sinful decisions is because we serve a God who does not change. A God whose faithfulness does not change. He's being faithful to His promises and the covenant that He's established through the blood of His Son, Jesus Christ. Look at 2 Timothy 2 and verse 13. That if we are faithless, He remains faithful. Isn't that a beautiful thought? That's the reason that we can sing these words that we oftentimes do. Build your hopes on things eternal and hold to God's unchanging hand. Another song comes to mind, Abide With Me. There's a part of that song that, be that should become our prayer on a daily basis. Change and decay and all around I see. O oh, thou who changest not, abide with me. We can sing those words because the faithfulness of our God does not change. Number two, in the midst of a constantly changing world, the work of our Lord Jesus remains constant. It does not change. We find that in Hebrews, the 13th chapter, in verse number 8. Looking at the book of Hebrews as a whole, we're addressing Jewish Christians who are struggling with their faith in Jesus. They've been converted to the New Covenant. They've been converted to Christianity. But they're being tempted to go back to the Old Testament law. The Hebrews writer, his message to this group of Christians in the book of Hebrews can be summed up in three words. Jesus is better. Jesus is superior. Jesus is greater than any aspect of the Old Testament law. To widen that a little bit, Jesus is better than anything that we could ever leave Him for. And so the question that naturally follows is why would we leave Him? Why would we leave someone who is better for something that's not as good? Why would we leave someone who is superior for someone or something that is inferior? As he's concluding that argument in the last chapter of the book, Hebrews chapter 13, I believe he makes a statement not only about the nature of Jesus Christ, but about the work of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the same, constant and unchanging, yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus Christ is the same, whether you're talking about the past, the present, or the future, all the way into eternity. Take a second to consider the work of our Lord Jesus Christ. What did Jesus do yesterday? What did Jesus do in the past? We could go back pretty far, couldn't we? We could go back all the way to the beginning. John chapter 1 talks about how nothing 
was made without Jesus. Jesus is the creator of all things in Colossians chapter 1 or even in Hebrews chapter 1. But we also recognize that the Word, John chapter 1 and verse 14, became flesh and dwelt among us. He lived a perfect life. He was nailed to a cross in order to die for our sins. He was buried in a tomb, but He rose on the third day. Forty days later, He ascended to the right hand of the Father. What about today? What is Jesus doing right now? Do we ever overlook Jesus' continued ministry on our behalf? Right now, Jesus is exalted at the right hand of God. Right now, Jesus is serving as our intercessor, our mediator, our advocate before the Father, our faithful high priest. Right now, He's in a position where all things have been put underneath His feet. All things have been made subject to Him. He's the head over all things to the church. He has the name that is above every name in Philippians chapter 2. What about the future? What is Jesus going to do tomorrow into the future as we step into eternity? Well, we know that one day Jesus is going to come back. One day Jesus is going to return. He's going to receive us to Himself. John chapter 14. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 talks about how when Jesus descends from the heavens, the dead in Christ are going to rise first. And then those who are alive who remain until the coming of the Lord, they're going to be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. And from that point forward, we'll always get to be with the Lord. Jesus is going to take us to our eternal heavenly home where His glory will be the light of heaven for all of an eternity. The work of Jesus, whether we're talking about yesterday, today, or forever, whether we're talking about the past, present, or future, do you know what all of that has in common? Can you see the common theme that runs throughout the work of our Lord Jesus Christ? It's all about us. It's all about our salvation. It's all about us as sinful human beings stepping into and living within relationship with our Creator. In the midst of a constantly changing world, the work of Jesus remains constant. The work of Jesus does not change. So often when we encounter difficult things, what do we do? We give up. We quit. We throw in the towel. I remember one time my family, this was probably when I was around 12 years old, uh, my family and I were in the kitchen. It was before dinner. We were trying to open one of these bad boys, trying to open up a pickle jar. You ever struggled with that before? This is what we looked like as we were trying to open up the pickle jar. It was just a little bit of a struggle. It started with my mom. She was trying to open it. She couldn't do it. So I raised my hand. Of course, 12-year-old Tyler was really confident. A, a middle school boy can do anything. So they handed me the pickle jar. I tried as hard as I could to open it. I couldn't open it. So I gave up. My dad was pretty confident that he could open up the pickle jar. So we passed it to him. He tried as hard as he could. He couldn't open it up. My sister, who was probably five or six years old at the time, raised her hand and said, can I have a turn? We all shook our heads and laughed at her. If, if we can't open up the jar, there's no way that she's going to be able to open up the jar. She took it in her small hands, put that hand on top, turned it one time and popped it open. Now let it be known, we're the ones who loosened it up for it, right? I, I think that's something that we all need to recognize. The point is, when things get difficult, what do we do? Sometimes we push through it, but other times we give up. We quit. We throw in the towel. Aren't you thankful that Jesus Christ doesn't quit when things get hard? Aren't you thankful that Jesus Christ doesn't give up? He doesn't throw in the towel when things get difficult. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. His work will forever remain constant. And what should absolutely blow our minds about that? is that that work is all about us. It's all about our salvation. It's all about us entering into and living in relationship with God. When things get difficult in your life, Jesus Christ doesn't give up on you. When you're struggling with trial or you're going through temptation, maybe you've even fallen into temptation, remember this thought that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus Christ did not give up. Even when nails were being driven through His hands, even when He was suffocating upon the cross for our sins, He didn't give up. And He never will. Even in the midst of a constantly changing world, the work of Jesus remains constant. And then finally, in the midst of a constantly changing world, the Word of God 
does not change. The Word of God remains consistent. We see that in Isaiah, the 40th chapter, in verse number 8. You look at the book of Isaiah, you can divide it roughly into two different parts. The first 39 chapters, and this is looking from a 3,000 foot view, but the first 39 chapters have to do with judgment. They have to do with destruction of the people of Judah, taking them into captivity in Babylon. But then you look at the last 27 chapters and it's a completely different message. It's a message of hope. It's a message of restoration. It's a message of comfort, which is one of the first words in Isaiah, the 40th chapter. You read down to verse number 8 in that first chapter that's centered on restoration and hope, and you find these words. God wants us to know something about His Word. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the Word of our God will stand forever. Do you remember that reality that we started with? We live in a world that is what? Constantly changing. Does Isaiah recognize that in Isaiah 40 and verse number 8? The grass withers. Today it's green and luscious. Tomorrow it's brown and dead. Flower fades. Last month was Valentine's Day. You get those nice roses sitting on the counter one day, fast forward a few days later and what? They're wilted. They're dead. Change and decay in all around I see. Isaiah recognizes that. But then look at the word but. In contrast to everything else that we see in the world, in contrast to the grass that withers and the flower that fades, the Word of our God will stand forever. The Word of our God is eternal. The Word of our God is unchanging. The Word of our God is constant. And you find that throughout the Scriptures. For instance, in Psalm 111, verses 7 and 8, notice at the end of 7, all His precepts are trustworthy, and the reason is in verse 8, they are established forever and ever. You can trust in what this book teaches. You can trust in the precepts of our God. And the reason that you can trust in them is because they are established forever. They're not going anywhere. In Psalm 119 and verse 89, the Bible says, Forever, O Lord, Your Word is firmly fixed in the heavens. Jesus says in Matthew 24 and 35 that heaven and earth will pass away. Everything that we see around us is going to change at some point. Heaven and earth, the sky and the ground, they're going to pass away. Jesus says, My words will not pass away. Then you go to 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 23. He actually quotes the passage from Isaiah 40 and verse number 8. He says, Since you've been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding Word of God. What's the kind of seed that we've been born again through? Not perishable. It's imperishable. It's living. It's abiding. And then in 24, you find the quote, All flesh is like grass, all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, the flower falls but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. In the midst of a constantly changing world, the word of God doesn't change. It remains constant. If you back up about 10 chapters from Isaiah chapter 40, you're going to get to Isaiah chapter 30. And notice what the Isaiah says about the people of Judah in verses 9 through 11. That they are a rebellious people, lying children, children unwilling to hear the instruction of the Lord who say to the seers, don't see, and to the prophets, don't prophesy to us what's right. Speak to us smooth things. Prophesy illusions. Leave the way. Turn aside from the path. Let us hear no more about the Holy One of Israel. Here's a group of people who don't want to hear the Word of God. They don't want to listen to what God has to say. And so what do they try to do? They go to their seers. They go to their prophets who are supposed to be speaking to them on God's behalf. And they give them the message, don't see. Don't prophesy to us what's right. Speak to us smooth things. Tell us things that are going to tickle our ears. Tell us things only that we're comfortable with, things that we already agree with. You're on the way now, but we want you to leave the way. Turn aside from the path. We don't want to hear about the Holy One of Israel anymore. They don't want to hear the Word of God, and so they seek to change the Word of God. Do you think that there are people like that in the world today? People who don't want to hear a message from the Lord. People who don't want to hear what the Word of God teaches. And so they attempt to change it. Only tell me things that are going to make me comfortable. Only tell me things that I agree with. Only tell me things that are going to fit the opinions and beliefs that I already have. 
People's lives change. Our culture changes. And so often we expect the Word of God to change along with it. May we never have that kind of mentality. May we never be one of those people. If we find ourselves in a situation where we're wanting the Word of God to change, it's not the Word of God that needs to change. It's you and I that needs to change. It's not our responsibility to change what Scripture clearly teaches. It's our responsibility to be changed by what Scripture clearly teaches. The grass withers and the flowers are going to fade, but the Word of our God stands forever. This is the reality that sometimes we struggle with. Sometimes it's welcome, sometimes it's not. We live in a world that is constantly changing. But as Christians, here are three things that we can hold on to. Three things that will forever be constant. The faithfulness of God, the work of Jesus, and the Word of God as we find it recorded in the pages of Scripture. Now, Lord willing, when we come back together next week, we're going to look at three more constants in a constantly changing world. But for now, let's ask and address the question, so what? So what? Here are three things that don't change, but what kind of difference does that make in our lives? How's that going to change the way that we live this week? Two quick ideas and the lesson's going to be yours. Number one, I hope that we'll be encouraged this morning. Change and decay and all around I see. Our world is constantly changing and that can bring so much anxiety, so much uncertainty. It can bring so much fear. Let's be encouraged by what doesn't change. Here are some things you can hold on to. Here are some things you can place your trust in. Here are some things that you can place your feet upon. Here are some things that are going to serve as a solid foundation for you. Regardless of what you go through in life, regardless of what changes in your life or in anybody else's life, here's a foundation that's never going to shift, that's never going to let us down. I hope that we can be encouraged. Everything in our world changes, but as Christians, we have certain blessings that don't change. So let's be encouraged this week, but let's also pursue a perspective that is spiritually based. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 18 that we look not to the things that are seen, but the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. This week, don't set your eyes, your mind, or your heart on something that you can see, on something physical or earthly. And Paul gives you the reason because those things are transient. Those things are temporary. Those things are going to shift. Those things are going to change. Instead, this week, let's set our eyes, our hearts, and our minds on things that we can't see. Colossians 3, verses 1 and 2. Let's seek those things that are above. Let's set our minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. Why? Because those things are eternal. Those things are unchanging. Those things remain constant. This week, let's build our hopes on things eternal and hold to God's unchanging hand. If we can help you to do that this morning, then we would love to as together we stand and sing.